So I'm going to argue today that we should lower the voting age, not to 16, which is boring, but to 12. We should be much more radical in our ambition. And that should be part of really a kind of a reorientation of our society to take much more seriously the idea that we live in a democracy. Right? We all think we live in a democracy, but often that doesn't really amount to that much. And our institutions don't always foreground that in the way that they should do. Now, obviously, this is quite a radical proposal. It's not on the agenda of any political party, certainly not in the UK, probably not anywhere. But that's the beauty of philosophy as a discipline. We're not having to just think about what's immediately politically feasible. We can try and think on a slightly broader scale and hopefully think a little bit more into the future about what might in the, possible, in the future become politically possible or politically feasible. So I think this is an idea that falls into that category, something that I don't think we'll expect to see anytime soon. But if everyone becomes persuaded of this, then eventually this kind of change could come. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to start by trying to depress you. I'm going to start by trying to upset you and make you a little bit angry and talk about the way that your society is failing. Right? As younger citizens, you're being multiply, horribly failed by the socioeconomic situation, by the political situation that you find yourselves in. So I'll start with the hat <laughs> to motivate it. I hope it won't be too grim or upsetting. And then I'll talk about, given that context, why we should really take very seriously an argument to extend the vote to younger people and really to everyone in secondary education. I'll then, after I've made that argument, I'll try and defend my position against the boring position that says we should just uh, drop the voting age to 16, but also against an even more radical view that says that we should just get rid of a vote, that everyone should have the vote, including young children. So I'm going for the kind of the, the middle course that says that that would be going a little bit too far. And then right at the end, I'll say a few things about the context of this proposal in light of both the COVID pandemic and the politics of climate change, because I think both of those shed light on why this is actually quite an urgent proposal. So I'll start with, I've got a few slides with just upsetting figures for you. So there on the left, is um, how much university tuition fees are on average in different places. If, you were, if I was giving this talk in Sweden, you might, in the next few years, be thinking of going to university, which would cost you nothing. It would be paid for by the state. If I was giving this talk in France or Germany, you might be going to university in a few years and pay a few hundred euro uh, towards that. I'm giving this talk, however, in the United Kingdom, where for those, I, I'm sure many, many people here will be going to university and racking up enormous, enormous debts when you go to university. Higher on average, actually, than in the United States. Like the most expensive places in the US are more than, than the UK, but the UK average is just super high by international standards. And then what happens after university? Well, I don't want to upset you, but many of you will find yourselves in a few years paying a huge proportion of your income in rent, right? A huge uh, proportion of younger people live in rented accommodation. And for those of you who might end up uh, working in London, you could easily find yourself paying 50% of your income in rent. But in other parts of the country, it's also a huge uh, proportion of income. So unsurprisingly, as you see there from the top right diagram, um, the majority of people sort of under the age of of 30 find themselves living in rented accommodation and paying a large proportion of their, um, their income as rent. Um, you'll notice that this is a big difference for many of you to the situation your parents were in. Even more so, it's a big difference to the situation your grandparents were in. Your grandparents, no doubt, were able to, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, sort of buy, uh, buy somewhere to live very cheaply. It was a much kind of easier world to be in than the world that, that you're in. So unsurprisingly, one result of this is that the birth rate is dropping uh, quite sharply in the UK, in part because of a kind of uh, a phenomenon that we might think of as planning blight, right? If your economic situation is precarious, if your housing situation is precarious, then you're having to kind of put off and put off and put off the kinds of decisions that in earlier generations people could make a lot earlier. 
Right, sorry, I said this bit would be a bit upset. So I think these features of loading people early in life with a lot of debt, economic precarity, precarity in housing, these are not unconnected to the fact that we have really a mental health epidemic uh, in the UK, right? One might think that in many cases, you know, people's kind of response to this is just a very rational response to a world that doesn't look like it's on your side at all. Um, and you might think this shouldn't be too grim, because there will be, there'll be a hopeful message here too. You might think that that only affected people from uh, 18 upwards, just, you know, this is about students or people in their 20s. But look what's happened as well to your interests as people currently at school. So that graph on the top right is um, the pattern of education funding. Sorry, I've dropped, <laughs> very bad practice to leave out the x-axis. But since like the mid-90s through to now. So as you see, there was a kind of acceleration in education funding up to 2009, 2010. And there's then um, a fall backwards. So actually, um, in terms of the kind of funding that is going from the state for your education, it's lower, uh, lower than uh, it would have been in many cases sort of 10 or 15 years ago. And it's so far below the trend that, um, that we saw over sort of the period from the late 90s through to about 2010. And of course, something else that's happened is that um, students sort of 15 years ago were able to claim an educational maintenance allowance, right? So people at sixth form who are from less wealthy backgrounds could get a 30 quid a week uh, grant to support you during sixth form. But that, of course, was taken away in 2010 by uh, the coalition government. So what you have, one might think, it's a situation where your interests aren't taken at all seriously by politicians in this uh, country. And I think... It's interesting to see, I, I think this is an amazing diagram. This is the way in which young people's political preferences seem to get systematically defeated. So this is the outcome of the 2019 general election uh, if you segregated it by age. So the map on the left is what the outcome would have been of the 2019 general election if only people aged 18 to 24 had had the vote. The Labour Party would have won 544 seats for a majority of 438, which is unprecedented in, you know, that, that's, there's never been a majority like that. Uh, but on the right, what you have is the electoral map, if only those aged 65 and over uh, would have voted, uh, where basically the result is almost exactly reversed. The real result is in the middle, and as you can see, the real result is much, much closer to the, uh, the world where only the, old, the older generations uh, had the vote, in part because of differential turnout, right? Your, your grandparents are much more likely to turn up to vote than our um, you know, siblings aged 18 to 24. Um, and in part, it's just weight of numbers uh, as well. So having painted all that slightly grim picture, here are two quite minimal accounts of what intergenerational justice might involved. So uh, philosophers talk about the idea of uh, justice between generations. And these are two really quite minimal accounts of what justice between generations might require. So on the top there, you have the um, amusingly named Leon Bourgeois, uh, who was a French prime minister in the 1890s, also a Nobel Prize winner, but a, a political philosopher in his spare time. And Bourgeois thought that each generation has an obligation to improve the situation of the next generation as a way of acknowledging and repaying their benefits from previous generations. So he called this a, a principle of, of solidarity or solidarism, right? So the fact that you end up in a world where you've been given all these gifts by the generations before you means that you ought then to have an obligation to make sure that you pay that forward to the next generation and to make sure that their lives go better than yours did. And one might think that that really hasn't been happening. A more minimal, um, a uh, version of a similar idea comes from the Belgian uh, political philosopher Philippe van Parijs, who thinks that intergenerational justice requires that each generation or each birth cohort should make sure that the situation of the next generation is no worse than its own. So he's not saying there needs to be endless improvement, which is what the first view says, but he says, look, at least it should be no worse. Now, I don't think that 
standard has been met either. Right? There seems to be actually a decline in various ways in the opportunities open to you. So our societies don't manage to do either of those things. So what is to be done? Here's where my proposal comes in. Now, I'm going to be arguing for dropping the voting age as a measure that we really have to do in light of this kind of this background. Now, I think the first thing to realize is that the limits of the right to vote have not been historically stable at all, right? The franchise, that is the right to vote, has expanded at many, at many different points in our history. It was only in 1918 that working class men, so those without uh, a particular amount of property, or any women at all had the right to vote in the UK. So when, uh, when women first get the vote in the UK, it's only those over 30, and there are also property qualifications. It's then only in 1928 that everyone aged 21 or over gets the vote in the UK, so less than 100 years ago. Right? That's the only point in which men and women over the age of 21 get the vote. 18 has only been the voting age since 1969, right? So not, not quite in my lifetime, but not, not that long before. It's really quite recent, right, that 18 has been the age. In 2014, uh, for the Scottish independence referendum, the voting age was dropped to 16 in Scotland, and it stayed there for elections to the Scottish Parliament and for local elections in Scotland. And a similar uh, measure was enacted just last year, in 2021 in Wales, right? So the voting age now is 16 for elections to the Welsh Senate uh, or for local elections in Wales. So 16 is almost a done deal, uh, or it is a done deal in, in some of the constituent parts of this country, even if not yet in England. But my view is that we need to extend this process of democratic conclusion, and we need to extend it in a more radical way. So here's my argument, and it's really simple. It's super simple. Um, why is it that we should extend the vote to those aged 12 and over? Well, I think people from the age of 12 are participating citizens whose lives are lived as part of our shared social and political institutions already. You're already a participating member of society. right? It's not, that's not something that's going to happen to you on your 16th or 18th birthday or whatever, whatever it might be. It's, it's, it's a fact already. Secondly, younger people have fundamental interests that are deeply at stake when it comes to how they're treated by the social, political, and economic institutions of our society. In fact, you know, we've seen some of the ways in which those interests aren't taken seriously, right, or, or haven't actually been respected in the right way. But of course, you've got all sorts of interests in, being, uh, in how this country develops, in economic policies, in political developments, here, and those interests, if anything, are stronger than those of older people, because you're going to be around here for longer, right? Older people's interests are going to be more limited in time. Yours stretch, by definition, right? Stretch further. And thirdly, none of you lack any general capacity um, among the capacities that allow people to exercise their democratic rights as voters or as citizens more generally. Nobody in this room lacks the kind of... Um, the capabilities, the abilities that other voters, other citizens have. So given those facts about participation, about interests, and about capacity, there's absolutely no good reason not to extend the vote to everyone of secondary school age. So those three claims taken together, so this is a bit of, um, excuse the, this bit of sort of uh, how philosophers talk, they constitute a jointly sufficient case for the democratic inclusion of young people. If those three things are, are true, then taken together, that's a good enough argument, or so I claim, you may disagree, for giving, uh, giving everyone from the age of 12 uh, the vote. As I've said, for A and C, there's no relevant difference between younger citizens, between teenage citizens and anyone else. For B, your interests are actually more significant and stretch further in time than others. So that's my very simple, quick arguments. So what might be the objections to this? So let's take those three things uh, in a row. So let, let's take that idea of whether you're really participating, whether teenagers are already uh, participating citizens within society. So I think what you get when you 
make this kind of argument is people say, well, they're not working. They're not paying taxes. Why should they have a vote if they're not going out to work? Right? This is what I think you would hear from, uh, from many people. But I think there's different ways of answering that. So just a kind of a superficial answer, a surface level answer to that might just say, well, look, many people do work part time. Um, lots of people pay indirect taxes, right? You're all paying VAT when you buy stuff, even if you're not paying uh, income tax. But on the other side, many older people aren't in work or aren't, you know, for whatever reason, aren't, you know, aren't engaged in sort of paying, paying those taxes. And you wouldn't say that, you know, if someone re retired or if someone lost their job that they should lose the vote. That would, that would seemingly be a, a sort of uh, a, a, an unpalatable conclusion. So it can't be that some narrow economic idea of contribution uh, captures the criterion for when, when you ought to get the vote. But I think, uh, so, I mean, that points towards a more fundamental answer, which is to say it's just an unreasonable, old-fashioned way to think about, about participation, to think about participation in economic terms, or to think about participation in society as about economic contribution. It feels like the property qualifications that we had on the vote in this country before 1928 feels like a class-bound um, and, and therefore utterly unjustifiable, narrow and impoverished conception of what it is to be a participating member of society. People participate in all sorts of ways. You make contributions to families and communities and to shared institutions. You're all part of a school community with a significant interest in how the school that you attend is governed, how it's funded, where its money comes from, whether it gets enough money, and so on and so forth. Right? You're, you're embedded completely in the society and the institutional structure of where you, where you live. So I've just put up this, um, the cover of this book by Linda Colley, which uh, just came out last year. And if, anyone, if anyone's doing history A level, I think you'd find it super interesting. And she, she looks at the history of citizenship and says, you know, when, when ideas of citizenship and sort of having democratic rights emerged in the 18th century, it was connected with military service. And this was part of why men, rather than, you know, sort of like army age men were the kind of central uh, target of, of political rights. Because being a citizen was seen as being connected with, you know, being prepared to pick up a gun and go and defend your society. But I think we need to, just as we move beyond that idea, we no longer think that only those who serve in the military should get a vote. And then there was a stage where we thought it was something to do with, with sort of economic contribution or economic position. I think all of those have gone now, and we need to have a broader and more inclusive and more, a more justifiable sense of what counts as being a participating member of society. So... Um, as you'll recall, I talked about status, interests, and capacities. So I've dealt with A. I'm claiming that nobody could disagree with B. Nobody could think that teenagers don't have momentous, important interests that, um, that are impacted on by how their societies develop in political and economic terms. So what about C? Do all of you here, do people under the age of 18, do you have uh, the capacity be voters. So I think if you went and sort of, you know, took this argument out into the world, one kind of objection you get is, well, you're not paying taxes, you're not working. Another might be, oh, they're too uninformed, they're too unfocused, they're not intelligent enough to have the vote. So I think that's, that's completely unjustifiable. That's not, it's not true. And even if in some cases that might be true, it's not a good enough reason to exclude everyone. Uh, from the age of 12 and over. So it might be true that some people perhaps lack some of the capacities of being like an excellent citizen, but you can't then use that as a reason to exclude everyone of a particular age group. In any case, that would apply a different standard to that which is applied to adult voters. I can think of loads of adults who are pretty bad citizens who make weird voting decisions based on like bad information. But I don't think their vote should be taken away from them. And if we don't apply that standard to adults, why on earth should we apply that standard to younger people, to teenagers? It would be question begging to do that, right? It would be to already assume that teenagers ought to be treated differently to adults in order to feed that into an argument to get the conclusion that they should lack rights that adults have. 
But unless we make that question begging move, there's nothing in general different to the capacities that people here have, to the capacities that your, your adult family members or neighbors or um, you know, fellow members of your, your political community have. Most fundamentally, it would just be against the spirit of democracy to make those kind of individualized judgments of people's capacities. Think what that would look like. Think what that would, who would make the decisions? Like would the, I mean, it, it's, it, it's not how democracies function. It's not how they function with older people. And to try and use that standard to exclude teenagers is just on the face of it, straightforwardly discriminatory. So we should think in terms of general capacities, not look at every individual. And there's no reason to think that anyone with you know, at least seven years of schooling, who are therefore literate and numerate, would not have the capacities needed to exercise the vote uh, responsibly. So what would this mean for schools? What would this do to schools? Well, I think it would make schools more democratically important. It would turn schools into part of the critical infrastructure of democracy, as the political theorist Jan Werner Muller um, puts it in his very good recent book on democracy. It would have to be the case that when you first encountered uh, sort of political argument, political discussion, political de deliberation, the school would have a role in facilitating that, not in being partisan, not in trying to get you to think one way or the other, but just extending what schools already do in terms of trying to create future citizens. But think how different it would be if your citizenship education, I don't even know what it's called, PSH, I don't know. Um, if whatever happens with regard to citizenship education wasn't a kind of abstraction where people said, oh, well, look, there'll be a point in the future where you get to exercise these rights, but where for everyone it was guaranteed, given that the voting age would be at 12, that you would first exercise the vote when you were still at school and where there'd be the kind of the infrastructure to help you navigate that there in your school and where citizenship education then wouldn't be an abstraction. It would be something real and vivid and immediate that connected with what was actually happening to you. And think of the difference between how, um, at the moment, politicians can give lip service to the interests of teenagers, but not really take them seriously. And we've seen in my sort of not very happy earlier slides the way in which your interests haven't been taken seriously. Think of the difference if politicians at election time had to come into your school not in a patronizing way, but having to take you seriously and get your support and persuade you, right? And where they were, they were coming to actually engage with you as equals and not just as someone that they could take for granted. That would be a very worthwhile transformation. So why, should, why is it not enough just to go to votes at 16? Why do we need the more radical move of going down to 12? So, I mean, the boring claim I should make is that I think all of these arguments support at least dropping the voting age to 16. I think that's just so straightforward. I, I, I think there's no good case against that. So I think the interesting territory is whether it should go further. Well, as I've said, if you drop it to 12, if you drop the voting age to 12, everyone's first general election, assuming something like a five-year electoral cycle, happens while they're in school and able to access the kind of infrastructure and the kind of support that... Um, that could be provided by being a member of a community that's going through that democratic process together. Um, and I think really that's the most important element of why um, if we were to drop the voting age only to 16, many people would still be encountering the democratic process for the first time where they didn't have that kind of support. And we'd be losing the opportunity that we have to make use of the institutions that we already, that we already have. And beyond that, when you look at the arguments that are out there for why uh, people from the age of 16 should have the vote, none of those arguments really justify only going to 16. If you talk about interests, if you talk about participation, if you talk about capacities, any argument that gets you to 16 should also get you further. So why shouldn't one go even further than that? So some political theorists, David Runciman, at Cambridge or Daniel Weinstock at McGill University in Toronto, they want to get rid of absolutely any age limit for voting. They think if you can hold a crayon and go into the, well, no, actually, David Runciman says six. I think 
Uh, Daniel Weinstock's view is more like if you can take the crayon into the, into the voting booth and make your X, then that, that would be enough. He doesn't think there's a clear... So why don't I go that far? Why am I, being, why am I defending this merely moderate position? Well, I think there's three arguments. So one, something I've already talked about, is about that, that idea of the kind of the school as, an insti as a democratic institution and as part of the background infrastructure for democracy. I think secondary schools can do that. I don't think primary schools are well placed to do that. And primary schools, you might think, have just got a very different function, right? They're trying to give people the basic literacy and numeracy and reasoning skills and social skills and whatever that then might allow them to be... Uh, democratic citizens. Uh, another argument, and this is uh, one that it might be interesting to make as I am in a, in a Catholic sixth form college, I think there's something to be learned from how religions think about times of transition, right? So if you think about Catholic confirmation happening at 13 or, or 14, or Jewish bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah ceremonies happening at, at 13, there's a sense in which having a kind of transition from being outside full membership of a community to being a full member of that community, having that as something that happens, you know, sort of early on in adolescence, something that the person undergoing that is aware of, and where it's got a certain kind of um, a certain kind of um, symbolic significance for them. I think that's something that, in terms of thinking about a secular uh, society, we can nevertheless learn from. Uh, some of the insights that kind of religious traditions have. So I think if we, if we dropped the voting age below the age of school transition, we'd lose that sense of, of this being a kind of status that you came to adopt, something that you came to attain in a way that you were conscious of when it was happening. And a third argument, I think, is about the kind of just the, the burdens of voting, the burdens of political engagement, right? It can be really unpleasant. You find yourself looking at graphs about, you know, what proportion of your future income is going to go to a landlord or looking at graphs about, you know, what your student debt looks like by international comparison. Some of it is a bit grim and unhappy <laughs> and upsetting. And I think, you know, it, it, we don't really want to be voting that onto nine and ten-year-olds, right? But I think there's a balance to be struck and nevertheless the time does come when it's, because this is going to be so significant for how things develop for everyone, um, it is worth thinking about, um, about the stage where that thought of, of it being a burden is more than outweighed by the interest that you have in thinking through those things and then being able to think about your political outlook, deliberate with others and, and have a, a voice in the political process. So that's my general argument. So I'm now going to make two related kind of, uh, a more kind of restricted argument about why actually the time is here for this democratic transformation and why now is a good time really to get serious about giving more political power to teenagers. So one thing is to do, one argument here is about COVID and the other is about climate change. So during the COVID pandemic, huge sacrifices were made by the younger generation, right, by many of you here. You sacrifice time in education, leisure, sporting activities, time with, with friends, in order to make an enormous contribution in protecting your fellow citizens from the threat of the virus. So that was a case where you guys, who were at very low relative risk, were, under the, were kind of accepting a huge burden to benefit others, right, to benefit your older fellow citizens. So in a less unjust society, that extraordinary act that you all undertook of like sacrifice and solidarity with others should have been recognized, right? A society that did take your interests more seriously would have said, oh my God, look what we've done to the younger generation. Look, look at the costs we've imposed on them. What do we owe them back now? Do we make university free now? Or do we embark on uh, a program of house building so that they won't be paying 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 percent of their uh, of their wages uh, in rents for, for years and years to come? Or do we think about universal basic income? Do we think about wealth taxation? Do we, like, the political agenda in a society that didn't take you all completely for granted would have been completely sort of revolutionized by the degree of sacrifice that you all made during the COVID pandemic. But none of that happened, right? Absolutely none of that happened. 
the response that you all got in exchange for the sacrifice you made, you're probably all too young to have watched Michael, uh, to have watched Godfather 2, but basically, you got the response that Michael Corleone gives to the senator, right? He says, my offer to you is nothing, right? What your political society gave you in exchange for this extraordinary sort of two-year-long on and off sacrifice was nothing at all. And that's really remarkable. And the fact that that could happen shows how weighted against your interests the institutions that we have are. And it therefore, I think, makes just very strongly and vividly the case that we need a different system of political representation. We need a way of empowering um, teenage citizens. We need a way of empowering the younger generation, or else they'll find themselves taking the brunt of these kinds of um, these kinds of decisions that are only too happy to take their their interests and their for granted, and just to ignore the kind of uh, the social contribution uh, that they've made. And I think related to that, there are some issues around climate. Um, so I think it's you know kind of horrifying but transparent truth that our existing political system, with its just incredible short-termism, it's very bad at thinking a long way ahead, in part because a lot of older voters have got quite a short time horizon, and its inability to act against the near-run interests of older and wealthier parts of society. It's just fundamentally failed to respond in the right way to the challenge of the climate emergency. That seems pretty clear. So if you're like, we're in, a, we're in a ship heading towards the rocks, but those in charge are refusing to listen to the pleas of younger passengers who are saying that we're heading for disaster and we need to change course. Under those conditions, the very least we should do is find a better way to steer the ship. We really need to find a better system of taking seriously the interests, the preferences, the thoughts, the commitments of people living in that society, especially those who are going to be in it for a very long time, longer than many of those uh, whose interests actually seem to get, um, get supported by the current uh, system. So that means we really do need, I think, quite urgently to find a way for young people's views and interests to be treated much more seriously. And I think that Reduction of the voting age so that pretty much everyone in secondary education is treated as a full democratic citizen. That's the way to do that. So I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. And I'll very much look forward to your questions and to discussing this with you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, before I take your questions, I wanted to ask you something, namely, um, Professor Neil has argued that you all should be allowed to vote. Is there anyone here who disagrees? No? Professor Neil went a step further and argued that actually 12 year olds should also be allowed to vote. Anyone here disagrees with that? Ah, a few more. Uh, why is that? Do you want to explain? Hi. Um, <laughs> when you when you do think about it, like, should twelve-year-olds be able to become member of parliament or something like that? Because there's no specific qualifications that you need to become an MP, so should they be allowed to do that as well? Mm -hmm. There are a few others who raised their hands to disagree. Yeah. Um, I feel like if 12-year-olds had the right to vote, they would... 12-year-olds would really care about that. Like, 16-year-olds would really care about that. Like, if you want to learn about parties, but a 12-year-old, I feel, would just want to go to the thing and play, and then most likely, they just become an extended vote for their parents. So, yeah. Okay. Any other views, sir? Yes. I believe that by lowering um, the age of voting to 12, it actually leaves um, young people more open to political manipulations by the politicians. So it, it's much easier for them to gain votes from the younger um, audience than it is the older ones who 
um, can argue the cases they've seen, they are um, more educated um, against the um, impacts that previous um, choices have had. Okay, do you want to reply to this, Martin? Fantastic, uh, really, really good objections. Um, so, do I think that a 12-year-old should be able to be prime minister? I, I think probably not, right? I think that might well involve uh, having some additional um, uh, some additional capabilities that that a 12-year-old mightn't have. Although at the moment it feels like we do have someone who behaves like a kind of a wayward 12-year-old uh, is the prime minister. So maybe maybe the current system doesn't uh, ensure against that. Either, but I think I mean one could think. For so, for example, in the U.S., there's a particular age that you have to be. I think you have to be 30 to be a senator, or 35 to be president. I've probably got the exact ages wrong, but there are sort of age qualifications for particular offices, right? Even though that's not the same as the age where you're entitled to vote. So you could imagine a system like that, right? That still said, well, actually, you know, given that everyone has to be in full-time education up to a particular age, given that there's very good reasons to, to keep that, um, that the, the voting age and the age at which you could become a candidate might be different. So I think, um, so I think in a way, there's, there's two answers. One is, you know, e even if in some way um, a 12-year-old were entitled to do that, very unlikely that they'd get the vote, you get very unlikely that they'd be elected to that, given that you'd still have the whole electorate right across the age range. But one could nevertheless have a system that tried to... Uh, to differentiate between uh, ages for candidates and ages for, for voters. On, on the sort of... In well, I suppose in a way, maybe the second and third um, objections are sort of related. So there's some worries there about like the autonomy of 12 or 13-year-olds. Would they be very open to manipulation? Would they just do what their parents told them? Have they not really got the capacity to be uh, sort of engaged in their own way? with politics. And I think there's a little bit of a danger there to say that, um, that we should take too much evidence from how people are at the moment and say that, they'd still, that they might still be like that if we had a very different system where everyone knew right, that when you become, you know, I mean, whether it's 12 or 13, or, you know, whatever, whatever age it, it might be, that you then did ascend to this kind of full, full sort of um, uh, political status, right? It might be that if you actually knew that you had a vote and you had the same power as, uh, the same political power as, uh, as older people, it might be that, that, that you'd have reason to take more, more of an interest. But I mean, one thing that might shock you both, I think, is that the kind of arguments you've made there were exactly the kind of arguments that w were made against granting the vote to women, right? People said, oh, well, if you give women the vote, They'll just do what their husbands tell them, that, or you know, they'll just do what their, what their, you know, their fathers tell them, or, or whatever. Right? There, there was a sort of, you know, there, there was a kind of move, you know, quite a sort of patronising move that, that in a sense was just a refusal to kind of take those individuals sufficiently seriously. And I think, I mean, I, 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 obviously, this is a different case, but I think we need to be very careful. About um, about not not sort of not making those arguments too quickly, whilst also thinking that actually there are many cases where you know people of all different ages are easily manipulated. Might see an advert on the side of a bus saying that three hundred and fifty million pounds a week extra will be given to the NHS, or you know, or, or you know, insert your favourite claim that turned out to be inaccurate, and the. You know, the hope is that if you're embedded in a political community, you can talk to, uh, you know, to other family members, to kind of members of your community, but it, that, that there is some kind of political learning there and that people come to sort of see when they are being manipulated and that they can then punish at the ballot box those who manipulated them. And hopefully that could be just as true of teenage citizens as it would be of, of older, older citizens. But, but really great, great objections, really. Really good, thank you. Does anyone want to? It's not over yet. <laughs> Does anyone want to respond directly to what uh, Professor Neil just said? Yes, please. Um, do you not think by giving the vote to 12 year olds, obviously you said about them like being easily influenced, 
influenced by people. But do you not think it would be then cutting off the maturity? Because as a 12 year old, I know myself and a lot of other 12 year olds won't have fully matured yet. So by giving the vote at 12, do you not think that would like cut off the chance to mature and they would feel more independent? Because I think the vote being at 18, in my head, I think you turn 18, you get the vote and then you're an adult and you're more independent. So do you not think it would be cutting off? Like they would feel like they had to mature too quickly to not, as a, as a 12 year old, still a child and they might have to mature themselves to vote responsibly rather than just enjoying being young. Yeah, so I, I think that's, that connects really closely to why I'd be really uneasy with dropping the voting age much, much below that. Um, but I think it, it's worth just thinking about, uh, on my view, like what, what's really special about, about that kind of democratic participation. And, and that right, as opposed to any other right. So I'm, I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm not imagining a world where, you know, 12 year olds are sort of cast out of, of, of the family home and expected to fend for themselves and where we try and individualize people much, much earlier. It's just about giving that very demarcated, specific political right to people. And I think one of the real, if you think about like the course of a, the course of a human life, if you like, one of the real, really strong reasons for, for kind of giving that entitlement early on while people are still at school, is that democratic participation and taking politics seriously it really becomes a habit. Like the biggest predi predictor of whether people vote is whether they voted in the, the previous election. And if you can get people thinking of themselves, not just as sort of passive, passive subjects that things happen to, but as people that have got as much voice and as much influence on what happens as any other democratic, citizen. If you can get that, that habit of thought in place early on, then I think as people do mature, as they get older, hopefully that, that will then be part of their, their mental life and their outlook and their sense of them, themselves as, as a citizen. So I think there's, a, there's an odd way in which your sort of future interests, your interests when you're you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, fully, a fully adult member of a political community are really met by it having been the case that, that when you were younger, that you were granted this, this right and that you got to exercise that and that that was part of your development. And if we don't do that, I mean, what we often find, I think, is that with the voting age at 18, it's exactly when people are like leaving home and when there's all sorts of things going on in their lives and when their lives are in a certain degree of flux that we're then expecting them for the first time to engage properly politically. And often that just really doesn't work. You know, so, I mean, even at the level of it, it being harder to register young adults because they're much more likely to be moving um, more, more regularly if they're, you know, at university or if they're traveling or, you know, whatever it is they might be doing. So I think there are all sorts of ways in which your, your future interests as a fully mature member of the political society are best met by having been sort of inducted into that political community earlier on. Um, and and that, that shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't depend on like a refusal to acknowledge that there's differences in, in maturity, but just instead to think that, that that's a really valuable thing to have been part of your process of, of, of growing up um, during adolescence. But great question. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, so you mentioned schools as a place where 12-year-olds uh, can get support. What kind of support will they get? Uh, isn't there a risk that they just get mani manipulated into thinking one party is better than the other? Well, I, I, I'm sure that, that the, all, all of your teachers are flawlessly professional and wouldn't dream of, of doing anything along those, those lines. I think, you have to, I think you have to sort of trust people in education and kind of treat, treat their, their own professionalism as, as something something significant and something that, that they themselves are going to take, take very seriously. I, I would have no qualms at all about, um, about basically schools having the opportunity to transform what they do in terms of citizenship education from being something that seems a bit cold and abstract and disconnected from people's lives to being something like much more real and significant where they really you know tried to engage. i mean for example you know uh, you could imagine a lesson where a school invited in you know local councillors from different 
parties or representatives of like uh, political parties at the local level to come in and make make their own arguments in their own way, right? So it, it's not about telling people what to think, but just kind of creating the kind of forum and the kind of opportunities for, for people to kind of engage in a way where they, they kind of feel supported um, that domain of politics. And I think schools are actually uniquely well placed to do that. Um, and I think it's, well, I don't know, there's, there's a number of school teachers here, they can tell us whether that's something that they'd be very worried about or whether it's something that they think they might relish, right? That this is part of making a really broad social contribution to your, you know, to your, your community and to your area, that you can be, um, you can be the venue where, where, you know, where pupils together kind of come to grapple with these, that some of these questions and where relevant people from the local community can be invited in and, and you know, encouraged to, to make their case, um, but where it's happening you know, on, on, on the, the student's territory a bit more and where they kind of feel safe and supported in that process. Before we start thinking about whether the voting age should be lowered, isn't it more important that we have like, actual lessons on politics and stuff because there's so many people of even my age and older that have no interest because they purely don't understand and they don't want to learn from scratch. Shouldn't it be at 12 where they're learning about this sort of stuff? Isn't that a more important question? So I, I agree completely that it's, it's very important. And I think it's a real worry if... I mean, there's an interesting... Um, there's an interesting book about the, uh, about the financial crisis of 2007-8 by a guy called John Lanchester, which is called Whoops. And he compares you know, what goes on in a country like the UK with what happened in the Soviet Union. So he says, in the Soviet Union, everyone was told how the system was to work. This was part of like, education. That, and even if the system wasn't working that way, people at least had a kind of mental model of how it was that these institutions were meant to fit together. What we often find in societies like this one is people don't have, from their schooling, a real sense of how the political and economic institutions of their society really either are intended to fit together or how they actually fit together. So look, I couldn't agree with you more that this is something that ought to happen within schools. And it's a really completely vital part of what schools ought to be doing, preparing people to be you know, full members of, of of a society, and, and, and you know, that, that transformation that I was talking about with, uh, with regard to an earlier question, to get people to stop thinking of themselves as just you know, buffeted by things happening over which they have no, no chance of control, but instead to think, no, no, you, you're, a, you're a citizen of a democracy just like everyone else, and if there are things you don't like, you can get together with others and look to change those. Having that sense of like democratic agency is completely vital, and we often don't have enough of that. So, I agree with you 100%, but I really do think that one of the best ways of doing this might be to kind of give it more urgency, more vividness, and more reality by actually turning the, the, the people that, you're, that, you're, uh, that are being taught in, a, uh, in the school system in, into people who are already kind of carrying that status of full democratic citizens. And then the urgency and the importance of doing exactly what, you, what you've described there become kind of all the more... All, all the stronger and all the more pressing. Um, but great question. We have one more question over there. Education about the vote and how to make your vote, it is important, but I don't think being able to vote is necessary for it because like, when you give people the vote, it puts them on the scope, sort of, um, on the vision of people to make campaigns towards and target them. And I think though we can't selectively choose our voters, we can train them. And a part of any good voter is the ability to have a bit of neutrality. And maybe by giving them the vote at the age of 12, doesn't that make it so people can direct campaigns at them and make young people more likely to have already decided what side they're on, which even though it, they might be with a side for a very good reason, as people grow up, they change perspectives and it could turn out that choices they made when they were 12 can impact them in the future, even though they've changed at that time. So I, th I think that's a very, it's a very strong and interesting line of objection. 
but I, I guess I, I think things often play out almost the opposite way round. It's precisely because people aren't having to make electoral appeals to you. It's precisely because people aren't having to, politicians aren't having to take the interests of, of teenagers seriously enough that you get these drops in educational funding, that you get, you know, the highest university fees in the world on some measures, that you get all of these sorts of policies that are exactly against your, your interests. And the thing that's really harmed the interests of, um, of you know, of not only you know, the, the current generation of teenagers, but of recent generations of teenagers, the, the thing that's really harmed their interests is the fact that people could ignore them. Um, and if, if politicians were having to direct at you their, you know, if their manifesto, if their policy platforms were having to be something that wins your support, you would find, I assume, a big change away from a lot of these features of the current settlement that are just so much about the interests of, of homeowners, of landlords, of retired people, you know, and they have interests too, that's fine, but their interests often get absolute precedence over the interests of of younger people, and, and that, that happens because, uh, because of this kind of democratic exclusion. And if we could get rid of that democratic exclusion, if we could kind of include people within democratic deliberation, I think we wouldn't see many of those quite worrying uh, economic trends that, that I was sort of talking about at, at the outset. So I think it's a really good, it's a good concern, but I think ultimately that it, it points more, more towards kind of the opposite conclusion to the one you were making and I think it's exactly about you know thinking about decisions made now that are going to impact you in the future that mean that really anything we could do to to include you in the process is going to make it much more likely that your interests are taken seriously but thank you any other questions yes please um, I'm curious on your thoughts to the opposite solution, which would be limiting the voting edge. I don't know. If, I wonder if you considered it. I know it's a very inclusive argument, and I don't know if it would limit like rights. But there's a lot of older people that vote, and maybe they're not affected by the votes they make. Yeah, fantastic question. So, so the, the, this chap on the bottom right here, Philippe Van Parijs, um, um who is so distinguished among Belgian. Belgian political philosophers that he's appeared on a stamp, and I don't think uh, I don't think any British political philosopher's been on a stamp. Certainly, no living one. Um, he has a he has a um, an article on the disenfranchisement of the elderly. So he thinks there should be a maximum voting age, right? You should get to 65 or 70 or whatever it might be, and then your vote is taken away. And I think that might have some of the same effect if if all that you cared about was sort of distributive outcomes, if you just thought, well, look, at the moment, too much of the, too much of the, the kind of benefits in society are going to this group rather than that group. If you were just looking for absolutely any way to, to sort of redirect some of those resources, that might be as good a way as, as my suggestion of, of getting that, that outcome. But think about what gets communicated with that, right? That, that basically feels like it's, you know, it, it's quite alienating and insulting to the older generation to say, right, you're, you, you just don't count anymore. You've lost this, this status and, and this, this kind of standing within the, the community. And I think, you know, it would cause enormous sort of resentment. It'd be a very tough thing to say to a, you know, sort of very public spirited, very sort of cogently reasoning older person that suddenly they're outside the full membership of the political community. Um, so I think my solution by being by looking to kind of increase inclusion, it's more in the spirit of what democracy ought to be about, of like the people who are living together in a community collectively deciding how things are gonna go for them. Um, so even if it were the case that that would be quite an efficient way of, of changing some of these distributive outcomes, I think it's got a kind of anti-democratic um, impulse to it that, that really doesn't fit with the kind of underlying values of democracy. Whereas my proposal, I think, is, is much more in keeping with those, those values. But it's a great, great question. I'll, I'll send Mr. Skelhorn the, uh, the reference for, for Van Parijs' paper, if anyone's interested. 
Um, you said like democracy would be like um, bettering people's interests and stuff because they get to vote. Twelve year olds. Is there not a chance that twelve year olds might vote like against their best interests? So like the conservatives offer like, oh, we're extending <laughs> summer holidays. We're getting rid of homework. It's like these are millions and millions of votes. It's like, well, it's not in their best interest. Like, is there not a chance that that could happen? It, it, it's uh, another great question. So, so one might think that that happens with all sorts of groups at the moment, right? You might think people's voting behaviour doesn't always align with their, their interests for other, other generations. And so, I mean, although I've emphasised, you know, some of the likely outcomes of this, I think fundamentally it doesn't turn on that. I think just those, those thoughts about um, status, participation, capacity, that, that they, they really mean that even if this didn't have the outcomes that would be beneficial for that younger group, it would still be the right thing to do. Now, as a matter of fact, I think it also would have these, these good outcomes, but I don't think it, it absolutely turns on that. But I think that, I mean, a couple of things to say there is that, well, I, I mean, first of all, that even if that happens with other age groups, we wouldn't think that that was a good enough reason to exclude them from participation. Um, also, the of course, the, the contribution made by, you know, this would just be sort of an extra either, you know, sort of uh, four or six years of, of voters. It's very, um, you know, so that this would skew the debate a little bit in one way, um, but, you know, perhaps it, it would be unlikely to be sort of completely decisive in, in many cases. But I think, you know, the third, the third thought is just, I think you have to kind of really, really, you know, just trust people, right? The... Um, you know, people might make mistakes, and that happens at every age, but actually, it's only by engaging in political participation, it's only by hearing arguments and sort of um, deliberating with others that people actually come to get like a well-worked out political view and a well-worked a well out sense of what their interests really are in the long run. So I think this kind of work of inclusion is going to give people hopefully, a richer sense of actually, you know, what they do want politically um, that, you know, will help in the long run to kind of build more active and more, more engaged democratic citizens. Um, but yeah, but I agree that these things are a worry and that, I mean, this would be a bit of an experiment and we'd have to see what happened. Thank you. What about pressure? Because there's 12 to 13, they're going through stages but also at 16, because they're doing the GCSEs. So about pressure, they could be feeling like pressured into doing something or not. So if they don't want to vote or they do, what would happen? Well, of course, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting mandatory voting, right? So it would, it would give people the same kind of opportunity to vote that older people have. But if, I mean, if an election came in the middle of your GCSEs and you thought, no, no, no I'm just going to do that, I'm not going to think about this, you know, that, that, would, still be, that would still be possible. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it, it's really about just, just sort of putting people on the same standing from an earlier age. And, you know, there are all sorts of ways in, in people's lives at different points at which, you know, the, the chance of political participation gets gets kind of pushed out by other pressures, whether that's young parents or whether it's, you know, wh whoever it might be at different ages. But I think at least having that, that open and having like those sorts of opportunities is something that's going to be really valuable to people, even if in some particular times, in some particular cases, it's not really something that people can fully avail of. But another really good question. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. You've been amazing. I'm really amazed at the sharpness of the questions that you raised. It was really wonderful. You should all come to Liverpool or to York and study philosophy. Um, thank you very much, Professor O'Neill. Give him a warm hand. Of thank course. you. Thank you all very much.